let's move on to the final part of thermal comfort, um, which involves a very interesting trade-off, a, um, a very tricky conundrum as to how do I achieve maximum thermal comfort, but at the same time make sure that the air quality is adequate. Let's take the example of this room here. In this room, I don't know if you all can see this, but there's an air conditioner in this room. Everything in this room is completely sealed. No air can leave or come in, which means that the air conditioner can shut off very quickly once the air has been cooled adequately and we can save energy by not having the air conditioner run all the time. This is a case where thermal comfort might be achieved very efficiently. Right? However, we have compromised air quality and even the health of the occupants to achieve this efficiency. This is sort of like the trade-off between natural light and solar heat gain. We do want lots of natural light to feel nice about the surroundings, to feel encouraged about our work, for our productivity to be higher, our, everything to feel, feel much better in an occupied space. Whereas that also brings in solar heat gain. So that adds to your energy consumption and your environmental impact. A similar trade-off exists here. You can have extreme energy efficiency and perhaps even thermal comfort, but you would compromise your indoor air quality. Right? So to improve indoor air quality, you would need certain amount of fresh air that would constantly have to be cooled. Right? So let's look at other parameters that a building designer should cannot ignore just in the name of energy efficiency and thermal comfort. So what does indoor air quality uh, comprise of? What is first of all acceptable indoor air quality? We talked about acceptable thermal comfort. Indoor air quality, when it's acceptable, leads to conditions where there are very small quantities of, or if any, of contaminants that are harmful to human health. The whole idea is to reduce the number of gaseous contaminants that are harmful to the human breath. For example, rising levels of carbon dioxide in the room. So once a room is completely sealed, over time, through respiration, the carbon dioxide levels will start increasing. That, at a certain point, would be harmful and a uh, you know, real hazard for the humans occupying the space. There could be similarly other contributors to contaminants, for example, adhesives, other kinds of chemicals that are emanating from various sources of, uh, of smell, etc. Right? Okay. So, indoor air quality is again a small part of what's called indoor environmental quality. Right? So this chart here indicates that a building designer does not just have a simple task of just maximizing one thing, which is thermal comfort. We can achieve this and at the same time compromise a lot of these things. If we remember this just uh, a few seconds ago, we were talking about the trade-off between lighting and thermal comfort. We can have a lot of thermal comfort by closing everything, have no windows, etc and provide very efficient cooling, but you will have no lighting, right? So the goal of the designer is to balance all these competing requirements and a direct tension exists between thermal comfort and indoor air quality, right? Uh, and we will now understand a little bit more about what indoor air quality is, right? So let's focus a little bit on that. Indoor air quality directly is directly undermined and compromised when you have any of these five parameters, right? Reduced oxygen levels, which can happen the moment you seal a space and have no fresh air coming in, air pollution from indoor sources, strong odors emanating from things such as the paints in the room, right? That can lead to indoor air quality issues. Dust generation, one of the reasons why we actually use filters, right? Uh, in, a, in a cooling system or even in a ventilation system is to prevent indoor air quality issues from affecting human health inside. What are the causes of those? So those things that we talked about which undermine indoor air quality, there are known causes of all of this. This chart here very simply lays all of those out. Uh, what I'd like to point out here is the central nature and the importance of mechanical natural ventilation. When you have inadequate natural movement of air, immediately you are going down a very, very slippery slope of bad indoor air quality because once that stops, there are a lot of other uh, cascading influences 
uh, that uh, this process has on indoor air quality. Uh, materials of construction, absence of exhaust mechanism. So one is air not coming in and secondly not having enough air you know, being pulled out of the space. And all this will be addressed in techniques for passively designing a building to achieve thermal comfort and indoor air quality. So there are mechanisms that can be employed which achieve both. So it's not just a attention in terms of making it difficult to, to solve problems. It also indicates that there are, there are uh, uh, places or intersections between these two competing ideas which can be harnessed, right? What are the consequences if we do end up ignoring all these elements in a building's design? Of course, they will lead to direct impacts on the health and the well-being and the uh, level of satisfaction reported as well as the productivity of the occupants. They could all combine and compound the, the problems to such an extent that it could lead to what's called the sick building syndrome. This is a recognized syndrome or a issue that occurs in buildings that have been poorly designed or have not uh, you know, adequately thought through thermal comfort and indoor air quality issues and other environmental quality issues. And one of the ideas that we had in fact uh, spoken of uh, earlier in the training, uh, especially for teachers who want to sensitize their own students or for example even a building designer to sensitize themselves to these issues, it would be very interesting to document the emergence and the, uh, the proliferation of the sick building syndrome that's slowly happening as our building designs are becoming more homogenous, are becoming uh, you know, inappropriate for the kind of climatic conditions we're in. Right? Uh, they're becoming less and less dis distinguishable and distinct from each other. So this would be an interesting exercise to understand as to how prevalent this is and can we through our design avoid this. So we know what the things that we need to avoid are, we know what the consequences of avoiding it are, what can we do about them? Right? So here are some control strategies that can be used to reduce indoor air quality problems. Of course, we talked about the, the pivotal nature of adequate ventilation. Right? Once you start providing this, a lot of the other ones also sort of start getting mitigated. For example, if you provide adequate ventilation, immediately you're removing pollutants. As long as you filter the air coming in, of course, because then you could be uh, compounding that issue. Uh, pollution coming in into the building. Controlling the sources right, of pollution, which means looking at internal and external sources of pollution. So one is filtration of the, the pollutants that are coming in, the ingress of them, but also looking at products and sources within the, the room which could lead to indoor air quality. For example, uh, a very well-known source is the kind of adhesives that were used in construction for a long period of time, asbestos sheets, all of these materials can lead to indoor air quality problems. So we can try and use alternate materials uh, and different ways of thinking right there as well. Here are, the, the next strategy is of course to remove the pollutants that do come in, right? And finally, treating the pollutants that have been removed so that they don't then become the cause of somebody else's problems, right? Uh, the idea can't be to just displace the problems from your region into somebody else's respiratory system. Uh, that wouldn't be fair. How does one go about actually detecting and measuring the extent uh, of, this, uh, of this issue in, in a building? In a reactive um, uh, manner, you can't really predict this uh, as sophisticatedly as you could thermal comfort, for instance, but you can do measurements retroactively to check whether you are remaining within the permissible levels of, of various kinds of, of pollutants and here are uh, instruments that can be used to detect at the level of parts per billion, which is uh, at the level of micrograms per meter cube. Right? Um, and these are, the, these are the pollutants that you can measure to be able to uh, check whether you are meeting air quality standards. Right? If you have further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us uh, on our email addresses or through our portal fairconditioning.org. Thank you.